Elliot as a human has all of the information, but as an identity, Elliot doesn't have all the information at all. Hello, friend. You're listening to Decrypted, Ars Technica's Mr. Robot podcast. This week, we're going to touch on that big cliffhanger and then dive deep into the mind of Elliot Alderson with psychologist Cameron Brown. Ars Technica's Nathan Matice here. Thanks for tuning in to this week's Decrypted. If you're someone who follows modern television, the word penultimate is in your vocabulary. And Mr. Robot's penultimate episodes have not disappointed. You're going to make me say it, aren't you? In season one, we got Mr. Robot and Elliot in that famous cemetery scene. And Elliot finally lets Terrell in on the secret that lurks in that Coney Island arcade. Here in season two, we end on a incredible action sequence where, well, we're not sure who's dead. I wanted to make sure you were okay. Well, I am the fucking opposite of okay. It's a tough shit. Some of television's greatest modern dramas, think The Wire and Game of Thrones for two very specific examples, constantly showed the audacity to eliminate characters no matter how near and dear they were to fans' heart. The story dictated that somebody had to go well, then somebody had to go. It's hard to imagine Mr. Robot without Darlene, but the episode really gave us some mixed signals. First and foremost, this season on Mr. Robot has been very, very intentional when it comes to its pacing and its cinematography. Think about how the early episodes in the season did a spectacular job of separating Elliot from the rest of the cast, portraying his reality as dark and grim and kind of fantastical. And later, it was revealed that, yes, he is in a prison. This was all in his imagination. Here, in this sequence, it's set up as a classic TikTok sequence. We know more than the characters that are involved. Hey, Cisco's on television right now as a wanted man, and we see FBI Dom putting the pieces together before Cisco and Darlene do. It's only a matter of time before those two forces collide head-to-head. That sequence is intentionally shot from a high vantage point on a stationary cam across the street. Once you get that, you know you're not gonna hear what's going on in the diner, and that something unexpected and probably a little unfortunate is about to roll in. Sure enough, here comes a Tron looking like motorcycle, and the man on it, or woman on it, but certainly a dark army element on it, is carrying an automatic weapon. What, What did you guys expect was gonna happen exactly? You thought everything was going to be hunky fucking dory. We also get a couple of sequences earlier in the episode that echo classic TV tropes. For instance, on a show like The Walking Dead, it's become a running joke among TV critic circles that once a character starts discussing their backstory, their childhood, or the origins of some personality trait that's now relevant to the plot, you know they're going to die within the next episode or so. Here we had Darlene talking about her childhood. She wonders what a certain parallel universe is like where she stayed with a woman who abducted her while she was young. There's also post-episode evidence that something we might not expect is occurring, and that came in the form of Mr. Robot tech consultant and staff writer Cora Donna giving an interview to The Hollywood Reporter. The big pull quote from that, and if you want to check it out, the interview is still live, you should always expect a major casualty, says Adana. And perhaps the best evidence of this is to look back at season one. There have been ongoing mirrors between season one and season two of Mr. Robot. Each season has revealed a giant twist to us where what Elliot was revealing to us as viewers turned out to be imaginary and not reality. AKA Mr. Robot was a figment of his imagination and alternate personality. And in season two, the routine he set up at his mother's house turned out to be a prison routine. There are also smaller pieces of evidence to back up this mirroring. Season 1 had Vega, Season 2 had Ray. Both were small enemies to Elliot that turned out to be harder problems than you initially believed. And Season 1 and Season 2 both revisited Steel Mountain in crucial early episodes of the season. So if penultimate episodes of Season 1 and Season 2 of Mr. Robot end up being mirrors, in Season 1, this was where we saw Terrell for the last time. Think of how integral he was to Season 1 of this series, and it is kind of akin to Darlene in Season 2. Essentially, if Elliot was 1A in terms of the staff list, Terrell was 1B in Season 1, and Darlene might be 1B of Season 2. Now, obviously, there are plenty of reasons to believe that Darlene survived this incident 
One, she's integral to what was going on in the plot this season, and if she was to leave the show, it would be one of the most unexpected deaths in recent TV memory. The only one that comes to mind for me is when Kate Mara's character was in season two of House of Cards within the first episode. But perhaps most reassuredly, the great sleuths over at the Mr. Robot subreddit have taken that final sequence, zoomed in, and slowed down to go frame by frame. And if you watch closely, it appears as though, one, Cisco is definitely a goner, but two, Dom and Darlene manage to duck and get out of the way. We get evidence of that within the episode when Dom comes to check out the motorcyclist that caused all the chaos, but we're left wondering if Darlene is alive or dead heading into the two-part season finale. Ultimately, I think the show can be interesting either way, but the bigger takeaway here is that Mr. Robot is a show that isn't afraid to take risks. If a character as central to everything as Darlene is on the table as a possible casualty, then no one is truly safe. Even with this week's episode ending on such a dramatic sequence, our latest Mr. Robot episode really hinged on the mind of Elliot Alderson. The judge made me go to therapy for anger management. I guess it's official. I'm crazy. Our latest Mr. Robot episode, like all Mr. Robot episodes, really hinged on the mind of Elliot Alderson. As the TikTok action sequence with Cisco, Darlene, and Angela played out, the episode really got into motion because Elliot was occupied with a phone. And once he picked up that phone, Mr. Robot suddenly disappeared. For all the action and hacking that Mr. Robot packs into his storylines, this is still a show that's driven by what's going on inside Elliot Alderson. How he deals with his various mental illnesses and multiple personalities, and how that impacts the people around him. We've been wanting to dive deep into Elliot's mind all season long here on Decrypted, and this week, we finally got someone to do so. Cameron Brown is a professional psychologist down in Australia, who writes about TV regularly on his website, Couch Potato Psychology. When I saw that Cameron had written about Mr. Robot several times over the past two seasons, I knew he was someone I wanted to talk to, and the lead-up to Mr. Robot's season two finale is the perfect time to assess Elliot's mental situation and how that impacts the world around him. Okay, joining me on the podcast this week, I am fortunate enough to have Cameron Brown. He's a psychologist down in Australia who writes about psychology on TV regularly at Couch Potato Psychology. Cameron, thanks for joining the podcast. No problem at all. First question before we even dive into Mr. Robot, how did you get involved with writing about television? I assume that is kind of fertile ground when it comes to thinking about psychology. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's... Uh... Uh, one of the places where psychology comes into the public domain a little bit more, I suppose, exposure people to psychology becomes a little bit more present, especially in shows like Mr. Robot. Originally, I got into it through uh, through Game of Thrones and a lot of talk about psychopathy and uh, and people suffering from antisocial personality disorder and all these kinds of things. And I suppose it's a little bit about putting the putting the record right about what 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 are these disorders that people are suffering from, but also just a bit of fun and and analysing and looking at the specifics of what's going on behind characters' motivations. As you have grown in your psychology career, can you remember watching TV in a different way before you started looking at it through this lens? Has that really changed how you interact with TV? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I find now I'm, uh, you know, analysing everything and looking at looking at, at, at I suppose views and and differences in opinion, or both online and and watching television about what the motivations of characters are. Previously, I could just enjoy television. Now, uh, now it's t now it's a job. <laughs> Well, let's dive right into Mr. Robot, because certainly to someone who doesn't have expertise in the psychology field, this show really, at least to me, looks as a show that puts psychology in the front and center. Elliot's struggles with his mental illness or with his various social anxieties are core to what happens in the plot and also to how we, the viewer, understand the story. So just generally, can you give me a little bit about what your impressions are 
watching Mr. Robot, is it obvious to you that there's a psychologist as a script consultant, for instance? Yeah, absolutely. Um, or, or obviously uh, writers who have done a lot of research in terms of psychological backgrounds and psychological diagnosis. Particularly what I see is the depth of the diagnoses and the depth of the characters. You've, you've got all these interlaying diagnostic characteristics, whereas some other shows will do people with uh, antisocial personality disorder or, or depression or whatever it may be, and they'll be quite linear in their diagnosis that, you know, they hit all the major points. They've picked up the diagnostic and uh, diagnostic manual and they've said <laughs> these, are the things that, these are the things that happen for someone with depression. Whereas in real life, in, in clinical practice, and especially in psychotic illnesses, often you'll see parts of a lot of of a lot of disorders coming through in an individual and it, and it makes it very difficult to treat even more difficult to diagnose and as a result people like people like Elliot often get very poor treatment prognosis or treatment at all so that that's interesting because I definitely agree with you that it seems like multiple things are going on with Elliot and I'm not sure we ever get a clean diagnosis from his therapist, Crystal, or anyone else to give us uh, a clue. But to you, it's very obvious. Multiple things are going on. C can you talk a little bit about some of the things you see in Elliot that ring true for you? Originally, season one, I thought there was uh, quite Aspergic traits there for him, a, a lack of uh, social engagement, it's quite odd and eccentric behaviours, very concrete thinking as well, very black and white, good and bad kind of thinking but then as the show moved on even through series one and, and now definitely into series two there's very much uh, significant psychotic type traits there as well which if you didn't know about if you didn't have feedback from other people or the environment you would definitely think that he could be suffering from just Asperger's. However, what we've seen recently shows us that those traits are probably part of, of what we call the negative behaviours of, of a psychotic illness, things like um, isolation, uh, social skills and all those kinds of things. So uh, e even for me, uh, as it's gone on, diagnostically things have changed uh, definitely. And I mean, you've also got things like an, an over-reliance on uh, medications to make him feel better, whether those are legitimately found or whether those are <laughs> whether he gets them uh, yeah, prescribed or whether he gets them on the black market or where, wherever it may be. But definitely we see that we see that very common as well, people trying to self self-medicate themselves in order to change their perception or change the way they're thinking or feeling when they get a little bit of insight into what's going on for them. That's interesting. So he's still revealing himself. You know, it's it's still a puzzle and, and Elliot's mental state is still kind of unfurling. You don't you don't necessarily, as an expert, haven't seen something that gives you a definitive look at what he may be suffering from. Because as a layperson, I just recognize he's suffering, but obviously the specifics are something I would have to read more about to even get a sense of. You know, the depth, especially of psychotic illness, can be quite can be quite long and protracted. You know, we're assuming that that Elliot is probably in his mid to late twenties. Mm -hmm. Early 20s is when uh, psychotic illness starts essentially to develop in people who have previously not suffered from, from psychotic illness and, and is the most common time period in our lives for those kind of illnesses to start to develop at, at their worst. So previously in his life, he's probably suffered from some sort of social anxiety. He's obviously had the trauma of the loss of his father. There's been a lot of things going on in his life, but over time and maybe a, a family predisposition, as we've seen most recently with his mother, there's maybe a family predisposition to psychotic type illnesses as well. So, you know, even even in clinical practice, we don't often see all of it, or, or the whole picture. We, we, you know, we sometimes see people in their early 20s who are suffering from social anxiety, but, but they'll represent in five or 10 years time and they're suffering from a psychotic type illness as it's developed. So definitely he's, he's very much uh, an enigma um, and, very, and very, well, uh, very well written and acted as well. Well, I want to talk specifically about some of the ways Elliot's state of being and his mental illnesses have come across, particularly this season. You mentioned these last few episodes. Elliot revealed to himself, spoilers if someone has not listened uh, to the podcast and not kept up with the show, but he revealed to have been in prison this whole season kind of constructing this reality in his head that perhaps gave him comfort or just allowed him to control the alternative personality of Mr. Robot. And I'm wondering, you know, the way the show 
handled that portrayal. How did that come across to you? It came across very well. I think that the living in the uh, the fantasy, fantasy world is something that very often happens in psychotic illnesses, but also the construction of a another character or another um, identity which protect, protects him and. You know, this most recent two or three episodes, there's that question in my head about uh, something like dissociative identity disorder or, or what was previously known as multiple personality disorder, especially with his depersonalization. So his ability to almost see himself from a distance yeah. and also those times when he goes completely blank. Again, that's a dissociative identity disorder is a diagnosis in itself. Although things like depersonalization, um, very much a, a hallmark of a, a, quite, a, quite a few psychotic illnesses, that uh, kind of distancing from self, the, the kind of out to lunch kind of look in the face, that <laughs> complete blank look in the face and people, you know, coming to almost, you know, being able to speak or have conversations with people and then coming back into yourself and realizing that you have been speaking, for instance. Yeah, that, I mean, that was a huge thing of last week's episode. It seemed it finally dawned on Elliot that he was losing time in that way and perhaps absent as conversations he was engaging in as Mr. Robot were taking place. That's right. And, and definitely that he's, it shows us too the, the compartmentalization of uh, Mr. Robot and Elliot in that we were talking about stage two and that stage two is actually his plan. <laughs> and and that we, we see that Elliot as a human has all of the information that as an identity, Elliot doesn't have all the information at all. It makes for an interesting ride as a reader or as a watcher, I should say. I'm not sure that I've come across many other television shows that function in this way. We're kept in the dark, but it's not due to the narrator's intent. This is something beyond the narrator's control. It's a process and an illness he's working through at the same time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I found the, this season to be a bit frustrating in pacing. But when, when the reveal hit, it was almost cathartic. In the, <laughs> the, it was almost uh, quite dissonant, say, in the first two or three episodes. It was quite slowly paced and quite confusing as to why we're in certain places and why we're having certain conversations. And then it becomes obvious that, you know, he's suffering from a, from a psychotic illness. And when you look back on that, that's very almost the pacing as well of the, of the show has been almost psychotic in itself. You've got these very down and low periods and then all, almost manic activity. And then again, you know, Elliot disappears for, an, for a complete episode. It's very well done in that as well, just, not just in narrative and, and what's actually being told, but how it's being told as well. I want to ask you a quick question about some of the other personalities and characters on the show. In particular, what are your thoughts on Krista and the relationship Elliot has with her? I know it was maybe more prominent in season one, but the big you know, hinging moment of season two happens with Krista in the room. Yeah, yeah. I suppose her her relationship with him is quite embedded and probably a relationship that, that any psychologist or, or mental health professional or even health professional would be advised to have with someone like Elliot. Where as soon as he starts to, I suppose, disclose information about her to, to her in, uh, I think, season one, mid-season one, he was talking about her kind of inability to deal with the world as well. And uh, I suppose that's that's when she should be either disengaging from the contact or putting very clear boundaries in terms of what the contact is. And I mean, even then, she's over involved. This season is when she kind of appears at the at the jail. She's there because of her partner, from my understanding. So I think very much she she's very much over involved, and it's very indicative, especially of people who work long term with people who suffer from psychotic illness. There's a sense of uncertainty and inability to help, and therefore some people put themselves too much into their work and take people under their wing, uh, so to speak, and and try and help them on a personal level almost rather than on a professional level. So I'll definitely think that her her. Uh, her head's in the right place or her heart's in the right place, but in terms of professional boundaries, probably not so much. <laughs> Which makes for compelling TV, at least, even if it is not the most professional way to hold yourself. Yeah, absolutely, because he's such a, uh, he, he's a character and a person that people are, despite his flaws, people are absolutely drawn to. He, and, you know, he's seen as a, you know, an expert in his field, not only within his field, but outside of his field as well, that he's almost anti-charisma is his mm -hmm. charisma. 
Well, I want to ask two more quick questions if you've got time. The first is, this has just become a, a show where the non elliot characters have been flushed out tremendously, especially in this second season, as you said. Elliot was isolated from the rest of the cast, and so we got to know the rest of the cast in a much deeper way. Are there other personalities that you're drawn to from a psychological perspective on this show? And, and if so, who are you drawn to the most? I think White Rose, definitely. There's, there's a bit of a, a, I suppose, a very big story going on in the background there, but especially Angela most recently, uh, especially there's been a couple of times she's almost been caught out um, and she's almost gone into these periods of complete blankness, uh, much as what um, it, what Elliot does. I know it seems like in the moment, it seems like she's you know, shocked or taken aback by being caught in the wrong spot or whatever it may be. But it's almost as though in terms of exposition now, when we're looking at, at how Mr. Robot slash uh, Elliot is acting around other people, he goes blank as well. So I, I'm interested to see what happens with Angela, especially given that link of the loss of a parent and her coping strategies as well since then. So I'm very, very much interested in, uh, in what's going to happen for her over the next few episodes as well. Uh, you know, I had a theory very early on was that in, in season one that, that this whole story is a construction of Elliot's, even when it's almost Inception-like, that <laughs> even when we, we learn a little bit more about him being in jail, how many more levels are are there to the the psychosis? You know, are we only just getting very brief glimpses into small areas of his psychosis, but yet it, it it's overarching and it's uh, far bigger than than what we know. Is he Angela as well? Is he any number of other characters? Yeah, and, and oh man, that <laughs> that could reveal itself here at the end of season two, or it could absolutely linger further into season That's three right. and beyond. That's right. I want to ask at least one final question. I know you cover a lot of television shows in your writing, and I'm wondering how does Mr. Robot compare to those other shows uh, from a psychology perspective? Is this one of the more accurate and rich portrayals of psychology and mental illness you've seen, or are there others that you think may be more of a standard bearer than Mr. Robot has been? I think definitely Mr. Robot has been one of the one of the deeper and more expansive um, experiences in mental health and psychology of late. A lot of the writing that I do when, when I, I suppose, talk about an individual character, I have to take traits and characteristics that have happened across three or four or five seasons and put them together and have a, I suppose, a provisional diagnosis or thought about motivations and things like that. However, with Elliot, it's kind of all out there in front of you straight away, even from, you know, that very monotone narration that he mm -hmm. does in the, very, in the very, very start, you know, there's something not quite right. So definitely looking at other, other television shows that may be more action driven, you know, you have to look for the psychology, whereas, whereas with Mr. Robot, it's very much there uh, in front of you all the time at the moment. So definitely, definitely probably, I would say Mr. Robot is probably the standard bearer of uh, mental health. I can't really think of anything else that's, that goes into these characteristics and is as popular as, as Mr. Robot is. Cool. Well, I look forward to seeing how this plays out, because I have a feeling we haven't heard the last of Elliot's internal struggles as this season goes on. Cameron, I really appreciate you taking some time out of your afternoon to chat with me about the show, and I look forward to seeing what you have to think about the rest of the season. So everyone out there, if you're listening, make sure to keep your eyes on Couch Potato Psychology as Season 2 of Mr. Robot rolls along. And Cameron, keep in touch. I, I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day. No worries at all. Thanks, Nathan. Oh, thank you. That's it for this week's Decrypted. Thanks this week go out to Cameron Brown, who joined us from Australia to chat through Elliot's well-being, and as always to the Audio Network, who provided all the music you heard throughout the episode. On a programming note, there's one episode of Mr. Robot left this season, but it's a two-parter airing in back-to-back -back weeks. We'll have a podcast after each of them, and potentially one wrap-up podcast after that. Make sure you're following Decrypted wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, or directly through RSS. If you got questions, comments, or thoughts, feel free to reach out to us, either through the Ars Technica forums or via email, social at arstechnica.com. Just put Mr. Robot in the subject line. Until next time.
I mean, fuck. We have to talk to each other on the subway. It's a long way from getting high and watching Back to the Future, too. <laughs>